Um, yeah, I just want to start off with um, just thanks for coming for this talk. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk as a follow-on from last year where, um, you know, we talked about the MT data on a very, very big scale with OSLAMP and, you know, the data we delivered about a year ago. This data sort of follows on from that, and really the main theme of this talk is all about scale reduction and getting a seamless EM data set across the eastern uh, Gawler crater, and that really helps us to understand the mineral system or the IOCG mineral system. Um, I just want to, before I kick off, just mention some of the uh, main contributors to this work. I mean, it's obviously multi-institutional, um, and we really draw on a lot of collaborators to make this uh, work happen. Uh, conceptually, what goes on is if you think about the mineral system on all scales, and this image on the left kind of really highlights the scale that we're dealing with, that we want to understand the entire lithospheric scale, so the, from the crust into the mantle. And the talk, uh, talk last year um, on OSLAM really highlighted the bigger scale of what goes down uh, really uh, quite deep in, in the crust and the mantle. Um, but the transition to a lot of the data that we have in the near surface, which is right kind of near the deposit scale, there's a gap in between, and this talk is really addressing and the main takeaway is what is happening in between that. As we kind of step through the crust and what is happening just underneath the deposit scale, you know, around the camp scale and just slightly further out. Uh, that'll be the main focus of this talk. Just to recap from last year, uh, the main ideas that we got from OSLIM data and also from other data such as isotope geochemistry, we have a lot of pointers um, that suggest that the mantle underneath the Gawler cratons on a really big scale is quite different perhaps than some of the other cratons around the world. It also means that it's uh, probably quite prone to the right ingredients to form mineral systems. Uh, Claire Wade, for example, from our survey has also done some really interesting work in trying to understand from isotope geochemistry of why the craton is different to some other parts of Australia. Um, and if you go up into scale, so this is now the previous image was looking really deep at a more than 100 kilometers depth. If you image these systems with EM methods, that's what you get in a sort of lower crust. Um, you know, we've seen these images around quite a bit that the margin of the Gawler Craton is very conductive. And again, the correlation to deposits is really remarkable. Um, similar also in the central Gawler where you have the Gold Province, there's also conductors aligned with that. And if you take cross sections across these, which is the motivation also for the work that we've been doing in the last couple of years, um, work that's been underdone, uh, uh, undertaken by the University of Adelaide around Graham Heinsen's group, is to image these systems on a very fine scale, kind of having stations every one kilometer, MT stations that are imaging um, the mineral system around Olympic Dam. This was really the main motivator for the talk, or the, for the work that I'm going to present now. So what we did is we sort of tried to focus, you know, this is a great example of a mineral system, but as a whole true for other parts of the IOCG system as well. So what we did is we um, designed a survey that is a grid rather than a single line to understand really the entire area, which is about 50 kilometers south or so from Olympic Dam. It encompasses numerous deposits, you know, Oak Dam, Carapatina, Maslin, Punt Hill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this survey was collected about more than a year ago uh, by, C, uh, by Zong. Uh, we've had it reprocessed as well, and it's got a variable site spacing, so it's a trade-off between, you know, the funds that we had available and also covering some of the known deposits that, that we knew were in the area. Um, what we also did is we co-located an airborne EM survey across it that's supposed to complement the data that we're collecting with the EMT, and that's just shown here. So the idea there, again, is that we have a continuous, seamless EM data set from the very, very big scale OSLAM, which is collected every 50 kilometers, having an info MT survey every, you know, one and a half and five kilometers down to airborne EM, which samples sort of every meter along these lines. These lines are separated about three to kilometers for most part and one and a half across Carapatina. Again, to nicely line up with what we see in the MT. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the data and then some of the preliminary outputs that we get from 3D inversions and um, 2D inversions of the data. And the results are really quite exciting. Um, if you look at the data itself, the image that's drawn underneath is the magnetic image. Um, it tells you a lot about the structure that's happening just underneath the sediments. You see the striation in the data, um, which is a signature of the Gärtner dike swarms. And it's also even in the data, um, which are here shown as ellipses, they give an indication of preferential current flow uh, that sort of drives the MT signal in the area. 
Um, and you can see how that really well aligns with what we see in the Gerdner Dyke Swarm. Um, so the data really responds to uh, the magnetization. You also see a change in character from the sort of lower third here. We have the Elizabeth Creek Fault, which is a major fault running through the area, and how the character changes further out to the north. So what we've done, we've got a two-stage process. The first one is to invert the entire data in 3D. Um, this is a really sort of new way and it goes beyond what we've done before across Olympic Dam. Um, the drawback is perhaps that you know, these are extremely computer intensive and actually the models are still running because we had to deal with really long queue times on the national computing infrastructure as well as the South Australian supercomputer. So this was also definitely preliminary, but they're already starting to show some of the major, um, I guess, geological features in the basement. I'm going to show you three depth slices here that just kind of give the main characterization of the data. Um, I'm going to show you a depth that sort of um, is really prone more, to, uh, sorry, uh, showing the sediments, um, which is here. So at about 300 meters depth, you see the variability in the thickness of the sediment cover, where uh, the sediment cover is a little bit shallower here. The bluer colors or the cooler colors are um, indicative of higher resistivity, so that means less fluids around, and obviously the sediments are porous. So you see an indication of where the sediments are thicker in the area. If you then go deeper down to depth at about 1,800 meters, you're well and truly within the basement. So what we're seeing here is more the response of the basement that's underneath, and it's more resistive in general in the eastern part than it is in the western part. Uh, what I've plotted here is the location of the major deposits again, so Kerpatina here, Oak Dam, Pantil, Maslins, for example. The correlation in a very kind of larger scale is really um, interesting when I'm plotting here the, from a solid geology interpretation, um, the Donington Suite granitoids. They roughly align where we see the resistor. So that seems to be controlling the main position of the resistive um, eastern part of the survey at about 4,000 meters depth. What well, you also see that you know some smaller deposits, such as Pantil, um, at least in the, the moment, give a hint in the 3D data that there is some enhanced connectivity there. So that's a promising sign to see in the data, and it's going to come out even more in the 2D inversions that I'm about to show now. So what I'm highlighting here is I'm going to give you three slices through the model, which I'm modeling in 2D. The main reason for modeling in 2D is that computationally it's easier to do. And what you can achieve because of that is you have a much finer cell spacing, so you can really try and tease out some of the smaller scale feature which we are not getting yet in a 3D model. Um, so focusing on th um, three profiles, I'm starting with the one east-west profile that goes across this area, across Carapatina and Kamsin. Uh, the second one has a different strike orientation, um, goes through Maslins and Pantil. The reason that it's um, oriented differently is it's more to do with the data. And the nice thing about an array is that you can really rotate your profile such that you can model the dimensionality and the strike of the data well, and also you know, focus on where the deposits are. It's, it's, you're much more flexible than just collecting a profile. And the third one will go through Oak Dam. That's the last one I'm going to show. So what I'm doing for all of these profiles, the bottom um, image shows the resistivity model in 2D. Um, the warm, warmer colors are um, higher conductivity, and we normally associate these with, you know, alterations, scan, fluids, etc. I mean, we probably don't have many fluids in the system anymore, but these are proxies for past fluid movements and alterations associated with them. On the top, I'm plotting uh, for all of the three profiles the gravity image. So again, the warm colors are gravity highs, the cooler colors are gravity lows, just to show you the correlation between the different data sets. So what we see here is in 2D, the image is much more refined than what we see in the, in the 3D inversion. Um, we are getting a lot more structures out of it. We sort of see in slightly arcade shaped features that are associated around these deposits. And then um, we're seeing in the, up to the middle crust, so the depth sections here go down to about 35 kilometers down here, um, that in general, the mid crust is much more conductive in along the eastern part or going into the eastern part of the profile and the entire array as well. So the correlations are really quite nice. Um, what I really like is this example. This is the sort of slightly um, profile that goes from the southwest to the northeast. So it goes from Maslins here, um, Panto there. 
I would like to point out a few of the correlations that I find quite remarkable. Um, is that we have some areas where we have the gravity is high. Um, it's not quite clear what these are, just from the gravity alone, whether that's within the sediments or it's actually sort of a response of the basement. So it could be mafix, et cetera, but it's not entirely clear. What we can say from these images is that it's highly suggestive that these are correlated to what's happening in the basement, not in the sediments. The sediments are pretty, pretty much the same everywhere throughout. There's not an indication that you know, one sediment package is different than the other from the resistivity. What we also see is that some of these conductors um, seem to be aligned with the margins of the gravity highs. Um, and I'm gonna show this also in the next example across Oak Dam. So that is really interesting because we also know that some of these areas are here associated with um, scarn mineralization and probably Adrian is gonna talk about this a little bit more uh, later. But again, the correlation of these where Punt Hill is and we know that there's scarn mineralization across this area it does show up very well in the model. And as the last profile, um, again, and I should also say that you know, these models are run completely independent of the gravity. So they're not informed by a knowledge of where deposits are, et cetera, but these are the results that come out. So Oak Dam West sits here, Oak Dam East is around about there. There's also a conductor associated with it. And again, we see some correlation with the changes uh, that we see in the gravity. So and again, gravity as a proxy for different lithological packages in the basement. You know, again, we see conductors coming here and along the margins, so again, these could be zones of deformation where preferentially we get fluids coming through. Um, the color scale is not conducive, but if you change it, you actually see a very slight connection here. There's one on the Oak Dam and further to the west. So these images, I find them quite remarkable because they are looking somewhat similar to what we see across Olympic Dam. Um, the, the responses between them are a little bit varying, and this work is still ongoing, but in the first indication, it's very promising to see that the ICG mineral systems footprint, at least in the kind of scale from between the deep and the mantle and lower crust and up to the very surface, has a um, fairly distinct characteristic. Um, I just wanna finish off by showing really kind of where we take the seamless EM data set up to the surface by showing some of the airborne EM. This is the airborne EM that's draped on topography here. Um, this just gives you an indication of the data. If we start with the image on the right, um, the um, elevation is exaggerated by about 20 times just to give you a better um, a feel for the topography in the area. You also see that some of these deposits are sitting roughly where you get changes in the, in the elevation. It might just be because you're biased to kind of seeing them where you have outcrop or where you see a change in oil coming off, off the sediment cover. I also want you to remember where some of the dry lake beds are, because these are correlating really well with some of the conductors in the surface, and if you take two depth slices that I'm going to show you, you see the correlation is actually really quite remarkable and, and stunning to see. This is a slice for the airborne EM between two and six meters, so it's just underneath the surface. And you clearly see where the dry lake beds are, right? So everything is conductive just underneath them. This is a lake here, there's a lake there. You also see slight um, depressions in the elevation where you see really well the higher conductivity, more conducive of you know, more fluid filled or more porous sediments come through. And again, for the deposits, you, know, you see there are some slight correlations here between them where the deposits are on the edge of those conductors as well, um, which is really quite nice. So I'm gonna finish up there for showing you the data set that we have that we're still gonna continue to work on but the early results suggest that, at least from the 2D inversions, if you really try to tease everything out of the data with the right resolution, the correlations are remarkable, and that's really promising to help us understand these systems and also how they form. So I'm gonna finish up there, but just kind of give you a little bit of a tease for next year. Um, this is not the only project we're working on. Um, recently, uh, Kate Robertson and I from the survey, together with our collaborators from the University of Adelaide, um, Scripps um, Institute of Oceanography, we are doing more MT around the area. This is extending a Tumby Bay profile where we're gonna see some results uh, very soon and we're extending this to the marine as well. This is a pilot study together with our collaborators at Geoscience Australia where we're really trying to understand some of the bigger eastern Gola crater margins uh, where we don't have good data coverage. So um, stay tuned for that next year. We hopefully can show you some results of that. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and again thank a lot of the collaborators who really helped making this work possible. So thanks very much.